All right, Dr. Gath. Hello. How are you? Pretty good. How are you this evening? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to let a couple more people um, hop in, okay? No problem. Uh, we've got 24 people watching us right now. Okay. And um, hello, everyone. I am back. <laughs> I am back to the living. Oh, I beat COVID. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says, I beat COVID. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and the main reason why I'm here smiling so big and so bright right now is my my doctor, my friend, Dr. Gath, Dr. Joseph Gath. And he is joining me today. Um, as you know, last time on our first, first COVID conversation, we talked about the emotional side of this. I had a very good friend, Angelique, on with me. And she talked about her experience uh, with COVID, with her family, and how it affected her family. And I talked a little bit about I really felt like this was like a spiritual experience. I'm on day 20 at home now. I, you know, I don't call it, um, I call it isolation. <laughs> I know a lot of us call it, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's isolation at this point because it is literally something you do by yourself and, um, and being able to talk to my doctor and, um, and the telemedicine piece that's, that just, literally got me where I'm going. Deliver your medications to the door. You're going to hear all this with Dr. Gath. Um, just really made me. And of course, I will never forget the prayers from God. I mean, the prayers and just God's direction and love and all of your support got me through this. So I'm just forever grateful um, for this whole thing. And I think I'm good. We'll talk to Dr. Gath about if I can go out into the real world again. But um I am just ecstatic in terms of just being able to survive this thing. And I know a lot of people out there struggling. So we are having this conversations because it is important to know the emotional side of it and what it really felt like from a, you know, from someone that had COVID or has COVID, but it's also important to understand the science. There's so many misinterpretations um, of what's going on in the media right now. I have not watched television and I think I'm going on about a week now in terms of just what, what I hear every day, because one thing I've learned about this virus is that you've got to have positive energy and you've got to get the right stuff and the right information. And I got my information from Dr. Gath. He is who I went to. If I had a question about anything, if I wasn't sure about what I was feeling or experiencing, he was the person I went to. I also had a very, very good friend, Dr. John, um, Dr. Johnson also was a great a mentor, I would say, in this whole experience, too. Um, and we'll talk to Dr. Johnson at some point in this whole um, COVID conversation. But Dr. Gath is world renowned. He is um, well known literally across the world. He is a, a Baylor graduate. And Dr. Gath, I graduated from Baylor too, but out in Dallas. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. when you're here locally, I was in Dallas. <laughs> cool. I got you. We won't hold that against you. Don't worry. I know. I know. I know you gotta love me. You gotta love me. Uh, so uh, I know you graduated 1984, 81 rather, practicing 34 years in infectious disease. I remember growing up hearing your name over and over and over again. You are the guru of infectious disease. I remember my brother got really sick, not to give him all of his gossip, but I remember he got really sick and you were the, when he came back from Africa that one time and you were the person he came to. And I um, am so grateful for you helping him too. So uh, obviously you know my family really well and, right. uh, and you've been, you've been here a long time. So uh, you've done a lot of good work, but most of your work is was during the AIDS epidemic. Can you talk a little bit about what that looked like? Um, what that looked like, and maybe just to discuss a couple of the similarities of what you see with that epidemic, with this pandemic that we're experiencing now with COVID. So when I first came out into practice in the eighties, that was back when HIV was uh, becoming a pandemic, for want of a better word. And uh, there are a lot of similarities what we're seeing with this pandemic as well as that as, as that one. There was a lot of uh, discrimination. Uh, they, you know, if you if you weren't gay and you weren't doing drugs, you weren't Haitian, you didn't have the disease, so you don't have to worry about going out and getting tested. Uh, that left the whole community vulnerable. Our African American community, I didn't fit that profile, so I didn't get tested. There was prejudice. We had to open up our own HIV unit so I could make sure that people would get taken care of back then. We didn't have tests. We didn't have treatment. And there was just a small group of people that banded together to open up at Park Plaza Hospital, the largest HIV unit in the country, a 79 bed unit, just three doctors running it. And we, as part of the community and what we wanted to do with the HIV epidemic, we did 
testing, treatment, research. And we were, with our group, we were uh, one of the leading groups to bring treatments to our community and to the world and now let that disease process become one that is a, a chronic disease and not one of, of certain death. And so we're very proud of that experience. And a lot of that experience rolls over to this pandemic. We're seeing some of the same things. Uh, we don't have adequate testing. We don't have adequate treatment. There's a little bit of prejudicial things about this disease. Oh man, I'm not gonna get close to you because you may have COVID. Oh, you have a mask on, so I'm not gonna get close to you because you may have COVID and you're trying to protect other people. You're trying to get people in a prevention mode, but they don't want to do what needs to be uh, done for prevention as far as social distancing and masks. And the difference with this pandemic and HIV is HIV was harder to get. Coronaviral infection, you can get simply by being next to someone that has it. And so because it's more infectious, mm -hmm. we have much more of a glo uh, global problem. We also have much more of a problem with people at risk, which means our prevention strategies and our testing and treatment strategies have to be accelerated to make sure we get ahead of this epidemic. And those are the things that we're working on. And what the community has to realize is this disease is new for me. 12 weeks ago, this didn't exist. Yeah. So it's a learning process for the physicians on the front line doing it. And I can tell you that uh, myself and my partner, Dr. Joseph Barone, uh, at UMMC Hospital, we have dedicated our practices to dealing with this epidemic. Uh, we are working every single day. Every day we round on all of our patients. One, we wanna know how they're doing, but two, we also wanna learn what's working and what's not so that we can bring that information back to the community. Uh, we have formed a Cure COVID consortium, which is a, a new group, which is a 501c3, that is completely dedicated to spearheading the response to the public health emergency that we have in Houston and Harris County. We're gonna bring prevention message, testing message, treatment message, and now eventually contact tracing message to the community so we can get, 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 get control of the pandemic now and be prepared if we have other ways of the pandemic coming forward. And so in conjunction with United Memorial Medical Center, uh, we're very proud of the programs we're putting together. And I have to tip my hat to UMMC. Uh, yeah. They've done 40,000 40, tests oh, here know. in Houston Harris County area that gives us an idea of what, uh, what the disease process is. And with that information, we can bring to the community uh, where we need to get our testing, where do we need our direct our testing and our treatments and things. And so a lot has happened in the last 12 week period of time. A lot of things we learned from HIV and a lot of things we're gonna push forward with until we get ahead of, uh, ahead of this pandemic. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I love, love Dr. Verone. He's done such great work. Je you know, Council Member Boney is a great, great friend, and um, I know he went through it too. And I know you were part of his, part of his recovery as well. So, I'm um, just, you know, it's, it's really good when you see us, um, really, really lead something head on, um, in terms of what's necessary. Um, so I know we touched a little bit about the African American community, uh, Dr. Gap. So in and there, of course, are a lot of rumors around of why you feel uh, or we feel that it's really touching black and brown communities more so than not. Can you just name maybe one or two reasons why you feel the most uh, we're most affected? So let me give you five facts. The first okay. fact is um, African-Americans are 12 percent of the population, but 33 percent of the hospitalizations for COVID-19. African-Americans are 30% more likely to have pre-existing conditions that, it, that predispose us to getting this uh, virus. Hypertension, obesity, diabetes are the big three. The third one is we're overrepresented in high contact essential services. We're the bus drivers, we're the nurses, we're the paramedics, we're the policemen. Uh, we're the Uber drivers. We're in a situation where perhaps we can't do social distancing as we can because our jobs make us do something different. Mm -hmm. And that makes us at more risk. We live in high density population centers, often in multi-generational households. How many people have grandma at the house to help take care of them or their kids just move back with their daughter because they're, you know, they're between school. And so you have multi-generational households where if one has it, you have risk people back into the household. And unfortunately, we're less likely to get tested. 
And that's on top of the whole issue of racial bias that has plagued us forever. So with those six facts, those are some of the biggest societal issues. Now, whether or not there's scientific issues about whether or not African-Americans are more predisposed, I think there are probably some things there that's going to take us a while to figure out. But these right. other issues mm -hmm. we need to deal with now. And the bottom line is, as I tell the African-American community, there's only two types of us in our community, the ones that have COVID, Mm -hmm. and the ones they're going to get COVID. Mm -hmm. If you have it, get tested and treated. If you're mm -hmm. at risk for it, you have to do social distancing and you have to wear a mask. If you can't do that because of your job, then you mm -hmm. need to have a situation where you can get routinely tested. So mm -hmm. if you get, if you're positive, then we need to get you in the care. And those, that's the biggest message that I see is our city is opening back up. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, we can argue whether or not we are or not, but it is, it is that's right. the reality. I mean, it's just the way it's gonna be. And so we have to do what it takes to do that social distancing mm -hmm. as well as the mask. There was a study just published in Corn uh, from Cornell that essentially showed if our country had done social distancing one week earlier, we would have saved 36,000 lives, wow. 36,000. Those numbers blew me away. I almost didn't even believe the study, but it came from wow. a very prestigious university. And so you can tell, how just a simple period of time with these things mm -hmm. the, is the prevention measures we need to have. And that is one of the things we pass to the entire community, but because we're at more risk, specifically also to the communities of color. Mm -hmm. um, no, that those are really, really great points. And, and you know, we do hear a lot about that. And there's so many of the community just say, but listen, I, you know, I live with a grandma. Like the, I mean, I can't, I live in a thousand square foot, 800 square foot space. I can't social distance. We have one bedroom and a bathroom and a half, you know? So I think just the community needs to be innovative in terms of how are we able to um, social distance within the household. You know, my son goes, he wants to go back to the gym. And I said, well, listen, if you want to go back to the gym, then unfortunately you can't go see, go see, you know, BB and Babu, my parents, because they're seniors. And my mom is a cancer survivor, as you know. and um, and so I told them for you to be able to go back to that space, you're gonna have to get tested. And there are some things we're gonna have to put in place. Um, and so even young, our millennials want to get back to kind of moving on with their lives, but you're right. It affects who they come home to. And that's the part that we, um, that we have to really keep in mind. Um, let's talk about testing a little bit. I know that you and you MMC have been on the front lines and making sure testing has been possible. Um, you know, I got tested at River Oaks uh, Hospital, um, and that's obviously how I connected with you again. I had an amazing experience. It was rough, though. I mean, it was hard when I when you when I got that positive result, uh, making sure that my team was tested e effectively and timely um, was really hard for us to do. Um, and I know that UMMC has really done a great job expanding. Are there anything? That, are there any testing sites that you're working on currently to make sure that we get these testing sites in our black and brown communities where we need them? Um, because our hot spots are the areas where we really need the most most of our testing. Would you agree with that? I agree with that 100%. And we're working on that. And I want to put the phone number 1-866-333-COVID. It tells you what the active UMMC sites are for testing, and they'll tell you the times, and it is all free of charge. And so you can get that done for no cause, no charge. Okay. The Cure COVID Consortium is working on taking these things out to the road. Uh, mm -hmm. With Pastor Ogletree, we just would, was at his church last Saturday and we had a treatment uh, testing program at his uh, in his parking lot. And we tested over well over 200 people mm -hmm. uh, over the few hour period of time. They were there, both the antibody tests as well as the nasal swab. And so we are organizing uh, through the Cure COVID Consortium in conjunction with UMMC, getting testing out into the community where we where we need to have it done. The issue with testing, and believe it or not, has to do with the ability to have enough test kits. Those swabs mm -hmm. and the media to put in, believe it or not, they're hard to come by. And I tell people, we've tested 40,000 people and it's almost manna from heaven. I don't know where we even got 40,000 kits from because we don't know the next week if we're going to have enough kits. And so one of the things that is factual on TV is that we don't have enough supplies to be able to push forward with all of the initiatives we need we need to do. And that's one of the things that we need to uh, hold our legislators accountable saying, you know, 
we're lined up for test, but y'all got to try to figure out where we can get the swabs and the testing material. And I'm on, I'm almost every day calling around to make sure right. we have enough testing materials. And so one thing is to bring it out to the community. The other thing is to have access to what we need to do to test. But we're, we're organizing that and uh, we're looking forward to continuing to do that in our community because at the end of the day, everyone in our community has to have at least one test and some people need to have more depending on what you're doing for a living and so sure, we're working on getting that organized right and as our and like you said as the city opens back up i know for me personally in the dental industry i want to make sure that my team tests negatives i'm at the continually test them um just to make sure that we keep our patients safe too so there, there are going to be a lot of entities that it's going to be a um a, something you're going to have to do a requirement to be able to come back to work in a lot of those spaces. And so, you know, we'll see how that how that kind of lines up as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about how things are going to look from your perspective with the flu. So a lot of people say, so first, is this true or false? Is this virus going to be affected by the heat of the summer? Uh, probably not. The only thing that's going to affect the virus this summer is how socially distant we are, period, the end. Uh, gotcha. The sun is just because you're outside in our 95 degree heat, it's not going to it's not going to decrease your risk of me, you giving it to me if we're standing three feet apart in the grocery store. It's just not going to make a difference. And so the answer is do not depend on the summer to decrease the number of transmissions we get. Okay. Um, as we move into the fall and when flu season starts back up again, flu season starts when, Dr. Gath? When is flu season? Well, it begins officially in November, December. The question is, are we going to see it move earlier because of uh, COVID virus? If you're watching in Brazil now, mm -hmm. Brazil, you know, they're getting it, they're getting hit hard right now and they are in their fall, if you will, don't forget they're below the equator. And so they're sort of in our September, October right now. They're getting hit hard right now with the epidemic. And so the concern is whether or not we're going to see it earlier in the fall because of a, because of a second second wave at that Second time. wave. Okay. Okay. So that's, so that's good. And these are things that are kind of people are talking about. We want to make sure we kind of, you know, um, get all the rumors out the way and really get the good information. Um, okay. So when I was diagnosed with COVID, we, you and I met and I was, um, it was, I remember I was sick on that first day. Um, I was really tired. So what I was, wanted to do, and this is me, just full disclosure, I'm giving Dr. Gath full open and um, um, all HIPAA violations are immediately removed. We're going to talk about me personally, because I feel like if you know what I was experiencing then, and he, I'm going to tell you kind of what I was feeling. And Dr. Gath is going to explain what was happening inside my body. And, um, and then, and then we'll talk about medications and why he prescribed certain things for me and why he controlled my, um, my treatment, basically not from a cookie cutter approach, but more of what my symptoms were. So Dr. Gath on day one, I remember Thursday, maybe Wednesday evening, I was feeling a little bit tired, much more tired than I normally would, was, would feel, um, in my normal day. And a lot of people know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, what is it called? A energizer bunny. I move <laughs> real fast, but that day I knew something was weird. What was happening? What was happening on that, on that evening when I just was just so sluggish and so tired. So let me tell you how this goes. The, the first thing, if there's any good news about the virus, the majority of people that get the virus will have no symptoms whatsoever. And that's a bad news as far as spreading the virus, but it's good news because most people recover without needing anything. And many people don't even know that they had it. So that's that's a percentage of people. There's another percentage of people that are begin to get sick with the virus. And what happens is when you get infected day one, it takes seven to 10 days for the virus to grow up enough in your system to start causing a problem. And you start getting, and the body says, okay, there's something growing in me. I need to do something about this. And what kind of symptoms you can have? You can have anything. You can have a headache. You can have shortness of breath. You can have cough. You can have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, no pulmonary mm -hmm. symptoms at all. It can look like anything. Once you start getting symptoms, then we start getting worried about whether or not those symptoms will progress. And the thing that we don't know about in medicine is who is going to progress and get real sick and who is just going to get a little cold and a flu and take some chicken soup and some Tylenol mm -hmm. and you're going to be mm -hmm. fine in a week. There's no way to predict it. People say, well, OK, it's going to be people over 60 and have all these other problems. That's 100 percent true. 
But there's going to be a percentage of people that are younger than that that have no other uh, comorbidities, as we say, mm -hmm. to get sick. One mm -hmm. of the first people that I treated was my trainer at the gym, who was an ex NFL running back, wow. who was in better shape than any of us, age 40. And he got sick as I don't know what. And we had to put him in UMC. It took us two weeks to get him fixed and took him three months to get over. And there was nothing else wrong with him. And so I can't predict who's going to get it. So I have to assume when you mm -hmm. call or anyone calls or starts mm -hmm. to feel sick, that maybe this is going to go in the wrong direction. And so what you're feeling is your body beginning to fight the virus. And so you have to make a decision if you're going to do something with that. The mm -hmm. people that get sick with the virus end up getting something called a cytokine storm. You'll see yeah, that on. written down. Hold but, on. That's, that's the magic. Hold on. Just before you get there, before you get there. Okay. So I had... So my symptoms were, for a lot of our viewers, my symptoms were diarrhea, vomiting, um, inability to keep anything down. I had no fever, no, well, I was tired and, and, and winded, but I had no real respiratory issues. Um, so you're preaching to the choir with that. Most yeah. people say, I, just, I ate something bad. Let me just yes, go get exactly. some drink and it's no real big deal. Yeah. It, exactly. It, exactly. Yeah. So then I knew I got, so, so uh, that following Wednesday, I got, knew I had a positive test and you said to me, your words were, and I'll never forget this. We've got to get ahead of this because a cytokine storm may happen. And that's when everything goes bad. Now, Dr. Gath, I never heard that word before. And I'm a scientist and I looked it up the moment you told me about it. No one's talking about on CNN or MSNBC. No one's mentioned those words. That cytokine score, storm is what's terrifying. And so I'm so I would I want to spend a couple minutes explaining of what that is. And in normal circumstances, that would be a response to our body to heal ourselves. But then there's another way, another pathway that puts people in the hospital and have the issues that 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 they do have, and and obviously could kill the host, which is kill the person, so cause death. So, um, can you help us define how it should normally work? And I remember you use allergies as an example of what that would what that your body is doing. So, what's exactly happening in a cytokine storm? So the easiest way to understand it, so this virus is growing in your system, body wants to get rid of it. Just like flu or cold, the body's trying to clean up things. What happens with the cytokine storm is you get an overabundance of a response. In other words, if I'm trying to kill something, a cytokine storm is I'm bringing a nuclear warhead to blow it off rather than a little BB gun. When you get this nuclear war, it blows all the good stuff up as well as the bad stuff. It damages your lungs, it damages your heart, it damages your kidneys and it makes your blood vessels constrict and you get blood clots and you get heart attacks, strokes and all kinds of things because of these blood clots because it's over exuberance of the immune system. And people are focusing on treating the virus, all this hydroxychloroquine and all this, which we can talk about a little bit, but it doesn't treat the cytokine storm. The best way to treat the cytokine storm is to give something for the virus so the storm never happens. But if you wait too long, and by the time I see you and the cytokine storm has happened, it's almost too late for the viral medicines and you have to do something to cytokine storm. If you give the antiviral medicines in the middle of the cytokine storm and then you don't do well, the studies will say you died or didn't do well because of the medicines. And it has nothing to do with the medicines. It has to do with you're treating the wrong thing at that point in time. And so when you started this, you weren't cytokine storming yet, but the winds were blowing and yes. I said, you know, let's get ahead of the virus. Let's give you a little bit of stuff so the cytokines don't go nuts and let's watch you every day and adjust these as you go along. And so you hear all of this stuff, hydroxychloroquine is going to kill you, never take this stuff. That's not accurate. It's accurate that you have to do it at a certain time and be followed by a doctor closely to see how it's affecting you. It takes about three or four days to kick in. Remember I told you? And yes. I don't feel too good. Wow, oh, man, what's going on? About day four or five, you sort of begin to get a little bit of instant person. And as the cytokine storm died down, then you started getting better. And so the key is blocking that cytokine storm. And that is why people are sick and going on ventilators and not doing well. 
So, so the confusion for me, right? Because of course I was researching and reading, right? And the big thing was, and a lot of our viewers have heard, don't take any Advil, don't take any anti-inflammatories, you know, don't take anything like that. But it's an inflammatory response that's happening in our bodies. So can you explain a little bit, of, because it sounds contradictory, right? So can you explain a little bit about, even though inflammation is happening, how do you choose which anti-inflammatories to use to not cause um, any harm to the to the host? Very, very good question. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of things to adjust the immune system. We have anti-inflammatories and we have steroids. Mm -hmm. The steroids are sort of the big gun anti-inflammatory. It sort of helps to turn everything off. And that's the one we use where you really have to turn things off. The other anti-inflammatory drugs we use, like Motrin, Advil, Naproxen, mm -hmm. uh, are there. Those accelerate the cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. And so one should not take Advil or that class of drugs. But there's another class of drugs uh, that are called COX-2 in here. But it's not important. You know, the word, the drug is called Celebrex. Right. Celebrex slows the immune system down without being quite as strong as steroids. And so it's sort of like, you know, if you're really storming, I got to go with the steroids. If I'm trying to prevent the stuff, I have a category one hurricane. Yes. I'm going to give you a little right. celebrate. If it's category four coming down the pipe, I need everything, this, that, and the other. And that's where you bring the steroids in and start fighting at that time. Right. But if you don't do that, you the patient or the person is simply not going to get well. So if you can't prevent it, try to mitigate it when it's happening. And that's what we're doing in our treatment program. And that's exactly what you did for me. So, so I remember telling you also, I had history of blood clots in my family. My mother had almost died of a blood clot. My grandmother passed away with a blood clot. Um, and so you immediately put me on blood thinners. And I want to kind of use my personal experience, just as full, you know, full um, disclosure, because I really feel like I want people to now, hopefully it'll help. Um, but then you immediately put me on my blood thinners. And so I was taking, um, you, you only put me on my steroids, I think a, for maybe a day or two, if I remember correctly, because I wasn't. Yeah, because you, you, you're a category mm -hmm. one. That's why we yes. went to celebrate you. weren't a category. So I said, all right, let me watch you. As long as you're category yes. one, then we're good here. And then we, yeah, then we didn't have to go for the full steroids for a longer period of time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then you mon you monitored me every single day. Okay. So after I after we knew I was kind of it had escaped the cytokine storm, um, I was still incredibly. Uh, can we talk about the body aches? What part yeah. of the body aches is that? Does which part of that um, inflammatory response is is causing the ache, the achy body? So I'm gonna answer that, but I want to go back to the blood clot and the, okay. and the sure. blood thinners because that's important. Sure. The, the okay. first thing I want to comment on it's important for you to talk to your doctor to tell them everything about you because i didn't know that about you until it was like day three it's oh my god say omg because uh, i probably if i would have known that at day one i probably would have done it there, there's a discussion amongst us about whether or not everyone that is beginning to storm needs to go on blood thinners and actually we're getting ready to do a study with uh, another group where everyone is going to go on Zerelto no matter what because the really downstream consequence is these are these blood clots. So I'm not quite there to treat everybody, but as soon as you tell me everybody in your family's clotting off, right? <laughs> pharmacy, I just need a delivery I here. Was, the I, was, yeah, I was already drug, heading you. I think I take I took like five 81 milligrams of aspirin. So I was like already on it. Already was, halfway <laughs> anticoagulated, exactly. So talk good. to the doctor, and those and those blood thinners are an important conversation to have with the doctor. All of this business with the aches and pains or all of these inflammatory things floating around. It's just part of a commission. It makes you feel like you're a freight train's rolled over and backed up and stopped. You're oh. aching and paining. And it's oh. just all this inflammatory stuff floating around that the body simply has to has to sort of slow down on its own. But if we got rid of the virus, the body says, OK, threat's gone. We're going to settle down. It, it can make you feel lousy for days to weeks. I mean, it really feels like you don't want to do anything. Oh no! I mean, I literally felt like an, you know, I don't want to see an old lady. I'm gonna see a baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was sleeping like a baby, like I was taking baby naps. Okay, we're gonna have a <laughs> couple questions, Doctor Doctor Gath. Um, William is asking: um, Is the consumption of raw garlic is that something from a kind of a you know nutraceutical kind of perspective? Is that something that would be helpful for us? So there's this whole issue about what other things can we add in to help with the body. Uh, one thing that we see 
is virtually everyone has about zero vitamin D in their system. And part of that, because we have zero vitamin Ds, we never go outside anymore. Like the old, you know, the old days when I was growing up, we lived outside. So what do you think to do inside? Yeah, <laughs> so good. Right? At least you exactly, have exactly. <laughs> so vitamin D may be an important thing. As part of our program in the hospital, we use a lot of vitamin C because we think those can be a benefit. Zinc also apparently theoretically has some anti COVID activity and things like garlic and other supplements, none of those things can hurt. Do I know 100% exactly what the whole cocktail is? No, none of that. All of those kind of things can help supplement getting your immune system sort of under better control. So zinc, vitamin C and vitamin D end up being some things we have. The, the, the issue with all of those things is, you know, is, is you're uh, as you're being trying to take care of at home and you saw it when I delivered all those pills, you said, oh my God, oh, I got man. a whole bag. It's so much you stuff. Said, okay. like <laughs> exactly. So, so I said, okay, that's your doggy bag. I'm not going to give you all that stuff at one time. Let's talk about what you need right now, which is we're A, B, and C. And we'll talk about how we're going to push in and out of these things as we go on. But supplement things like that can help. Can they help you even prevent it? I don't know. I wouldn't do it over a mask and social distancing, but if you want to do some vitamin C and some vitamin D and a little bit of garlic to get you as strong as possible, I can't argue with that. Okay. Well, I will say that, you know, when I first, when the COVID things started happening, I did start doing the zinc and the vitamin D and the um, the vitamin C. You you had me on, a, you had me on what, five grams of vitamin C. I had to get a fair amount. We're, we're, gonna fill, yeah, we're filling up your tank. Up. We're filling up. If we're going to do it, we're going to fill up your tank to make sure that you got enough on board. You can't really overdose on that on the short term. Yeah. 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 No, so you had me, you had, you definitely had me looped up. Okay. So another question, Sarah Silver is a good friend of yours. You remember Sarah? So Quite well, had, yeah. Yes, yes. So Sarah's asking about um, shingle. She heard that um, it's possible. Is there a correlation between between shingles and COVID? Uh, there are different kinds of viruses, if you will. They're not really related. Can people that have COVID get shingles because your immune system is out of whack? The answer is yes. If you have shingles, you're a little bit more immunosuppressed to be able to get COVID. The answer is yes, because that all those things are sort of directly affect your immune system in different ways. So they can be correlated by making a little bit more risk, but they're two different families of viruses that probably affect you differently on their own right. Got it. Got it. Okay, another question from Coretta. Um, what can people without health insurance do early on if they test positive for COVID? Good question. The most important thing right now before Washington changes their minds is that everyone with COVID no insurance, underinsured, copay can get treated at no charge. The oh, United States government will pay for COVID treatment at the institutions that you go to. Our UMMC affiliates, we take anybody, no matter what, insurance or no insurance with COVID-19. And that's another reason why we need to get tested now, because mm -hmm. if you do have it, we want to be able to treat you while it can be done at no charge. And that's very different than the old HIV epidemic. HIV epidemic, you get tested, but they couldn't afford the things that we did. And they would go out, why am I going to get tested if I can't get treated? It's a waste right. of time. Right. And they were sort of right. But now you can get tested and get first rate treatment for nothing. And I encourage our community to do it now before our brilliant friends in Washington decide to take that away. It really is important for us to do that now. And that's really where I'm really pushing our, our testing programs more than ever. One, obviously, I want to stop the epidemic from spreading, but I want to get those that have it treated, one, to get them well, but two, if I get you treated, you're not gonna spread it to the next person be, with you being sick wherever you are at this time. So that's important. Well, that's really important, everyone that's watching today to spread to the communities that everything is free. The government is covering this. So there's no real reason. There's no, I didn't have insurance or um, I don't have you know health, uh, coverage. I will tell you though, my, Medica my, my doggy bag that you sent to my house with all my medications yes. in it. Yes. I know that was expensive and I can only imagine what that would have looked like without insurance. And exactly. so how, how are medications being handled? Is anyone? Same kind of way. It can be, it can be billed to the United States government right now. And as long as they are taking the bills, we need to do it now before they change their mind. And again, I don't know how all places are doing it, but you're sure. MMC, we would, we have an outpatient and an inpatient clinic. You come, don't worry about anything with any of that. They will send the bill where it needs to go. You come and get your medicine and your treatment. Okay, that's 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 really, really amazing information. Um, question, um, if someone had, going back to shingles again, if okay. someone had COVID, um, not sure, but 
probably had COVID early on, like in November, like early yeah. before everything was really, we knew what, what it was. Can that cause your immune system to be suppressed long enough to where if you got shingles now that you're that immune that you would be that immunosuppressed over that period of time? Is that possible, Dr. Gow? That's that's a very interesting question at this time. The answer is we don't know because we haven't been around it for a long time. But I can tell you, I've seen people that have had um, COVID for a while and still have problems downstream several weeks later. So the answer to that question is it's a definite maybe. And as we're learning, I think we're going to see people having downstream downstream immunologic consequences from having the COVID virus. And the answer to that question is yes. So they should go to their doctor? And I, would get, I would get a doctor, one, to figure it out, but two, so we can, this is, we have to learn. I need to answer that question scientifically because if if you have that, there's going to be other people that are going to be at risk. And instead of me just saying, hey, you're fine, I may need to check somebody again six months later down the line to make sure nothing else is happening in their system. And so it's important for us to figure it out scientifically, but theoretically, that could be a possibility. Okay. Okay. That's good information. So we'll have to, you may get a couple of referral doc patients from this conversation. <laughs> All right. Got you. We'll see what we can do. No problem. Okay. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here that people are asking. They're such great questions. Um, um, okay. So Stephanie's saying as you know, cause she's older, she as a senior, it's still important to get your, your shingles prevention shots. Um, Absolutely, no, no doubt about it. You need to get vaccinated, uh, especially now because, it, you know, if it's going to come back around, I don't have to. I don't want to worry about flu. I want to take all those other things out of the yeah, equation, yeah, uh, right. you know, because people come in and they're sick. If you didn't get the flu shot or the shingle shot, then my mind is getting, you know, my mind is wide about everything it can be. But if I know you've had the flu shot and the shingle shot and the everything's up to date, then I can sort of not worry about those things quite as much and focus mm -hmm. in about whether or not this is COVID, especially, especially this year when this is, when, uh, when the, when the, uh, when we really don't know what we're going to exactly get in the fall. Right. right. Okay. Got it. Uh, anyone watching? Um, we've got about 115 people watching right now. Um, just send me messages, guys. Just just type in your message on the side. I'm reading all those out. We've got about 15 minutes left on the show. So um, we want to just, this is, this is, um, an honor to have Dr. Gath here. He is a um, infectious disease specialist um, in the city. He's world renowned. Um, he got his, um, not got his start, but he really, really got on the map with the AIDS when the AIDS epidemic happened um, in the city of Houston. So please ask your, ask me your questions. No question is not a good question. Um, everyone needs to understand um, what's going on in this situation. Um, so Dr. Gath, we're going to talk a little bit about recovery, if that's okay with you. Um, so right now, we, this was the most, probably one of the most interesting things you told me. I asked you when I can test out. And you said to me that um, that's kind of a misnomer in some ways. So yeah. can we talk about the PCR test, which is a nose swab. So guys, there are two tests you can take. There's an antibody and a PCR test. Um, and that the PCR is a swab test. Tell me, Dr. Gath, why if I go get tested right now, at, at, River, at River Oaks um, Hospital, which I'm going to go back because I just love them so much. Um, what if it came back, by po back positive or what would so, be negative? So, so let's talk about testing in general. Okay. So there's two types of tests you said. One is a PCR test. PCR looks for the presence of the virus in your system. And it's pretty much a nasal swab that they put in some media and they send it off to the lab. Now, the benefits of that test is if it's positive, that means you may have the virus in your system. The downside of the test is there may be a 40% false negative rate. So if you do the test and it's negative, it doesn't mean you necessarily don't have it. It means that you don't look like you have it. And I say that to say you should never do any of these tests and interpret them on your own. You should do the test and talk to your healthcare professional, hey, you know what, I just got this test, but I think I got exposed yesterday because I went down to the club and people were coughing on me. Well, the test isn't gonna be positive the next day. It right. may take a while. And so you need to get the test and have somebody tell you what it means in that context. But the importance of it is if it is positive, we get a little bit worried about you being contagious. As the disease goes down the pike, 
the PCR test goes away and you become less infectious. We don't know how long that takes. We think it's an average of two weeks. It may take longer. But to get back in society, we say people need to have a negative test to go back to work. Right. The problem with that is that when you do the PCR test, it doesn't tell you if there's live virus in your nose or dead virus in your nose. And in fact, there are studies where people have tested every day and the test is positive for six weeks. Because probably it is picking up dead virus. And while we're scientifically working through this, the thought process is, is if you've been through COVID and you feel better just like you, mm -hmm. then this test probably doesn't mean quite as much. And in fact, in Korea, where they're a little bit ahead of the curve in testing, they don't even test, they don't test anybody with the PCR test after they've had the virus before they return to society. And you, because we're not there, we're gonna test you to make sure the virus is gone. If it's still positive, it doesn't mean, oh my God, I'm still positive. I mean, eh, you probably don't probably need to go back to to work with a, around a bunch of people that I know you're gonna do your distancing and your mask because you do, you're doing the right thing. But it, then it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean you're infectious to those around you. So keep doing what you're doing. The second test is called an antibody test. The antibody tells me that you are successfully fighting the virus. And it takes anywhere from seven days to 21 days for those antibodies to come up. And that's the little finger stick blood test that we see. And it tells us that you're responding to the virus. Full disclosure in you, I've done the antibody test in you. And you have three antibodies are out there fighting. One is called IgM. That's the first one that comes and it comes up and starts coming down. That's what's happening with you. IgG comes and it stays up. And that's hopefully one that will prevent you from ever getting this again. And a new test, you're one of the first people I've done it on. It's called an IgA test. Okay. It's a special antibody that lives in your nose. And all it does is sit there and watch for COVID and yours is positive, which means that you have an army in your nose and throat just waiting for COVID to come back and says, now yeah, you ain't coming in here no more. We got this. So that's all good. So that's what the, yeah. yeah. What's that? I'm a superhero. Yeah, you are. And that just came back today. So that's, that's your present for the, for the cast here, but that's very good. And that means that hopefully you're going to be immune to ever seeing COVID-19 again. Now we don't know hundred percent, but more than likely you're probably going to be okay. But the antibody test test your that you if you if you're positive, you've never been sick, that means you've had it in the past. If you're positive during your treatment, during the treatment, that means your body's beginning to fight. So those are the two tests that your doctors may end up doing. And we've done we don't need to do any more antibodies than you because you're good. We're going to do the PCR testing to make sure the PCR has gone away. So wow. those are the tests that are going to be available. As you do the routine surveillance screens, most people are going to do the PCR because we want to know whether or not you've got the virus now mm -hmm. before you go back to work or go back home and that kind of thing. Got you. That's amazing. Cause I just did not know that a live, I mean, I didn't know a dead virus would show up positive. That's just that's, yeah. that was the best information I got from you. Okay. Yeah. okay. A couple of, uh, let's just, just do true or false here. Are men, are women more susceptible of COVID than men? That's a good question. So far, it looks like more men are getting infected with the virus than, than women. We don't know why. It may be because uh, there are more, there are more comorbid conditions. There may be more receptors for the virus to bind, but it looks like there may be more men than women. Having said this, mm -hmm. women, you're not, I don't want to get there and say, I'm a woman. You got this. It is only men. Everybody needs to get tested, even if you may have a little bit less of a chance being a woman than a man. But everyone needs to get tested. OK, we've got this one of these one of these questions, Dr. Gath, that um, just because we're girls and we've been, you know, in full on, you know, yeah. <laughs> can you get your hair done if your hairstylist has a mask on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm asking me my first mask. You, you know. <laughs> I feel you. I'm, I'm, I'm my, 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 my beautiful wife. We had that discussion. I mean, I'm not going anywhere until I get this taken care of. You know, here's the reality. At some point in time, we have to go back out in the real world. I mean, we really do. Uh, and that's one of the things that are, you know, hands, feet and nails you have to do. So in a salon that does the appropriate cleaning, disinfecting, you're not sitting around with a whole bunch of people and things, and you got your mask on or, the, or your hair size and mask on, you know, quite frankly, I think it's okay. okay. I mean, I really do. But we have to make sure that 
their people are doing what they're supposed to do. Right. And that's yeah. that's what's very important, that you go to a salon that, that is going to do everything it takes to keep uh, both people safe, the, uh, the beautician as well as, as the person. So the answer to that question is we're opening up. The reality is people are gonna, people are gonna go out there no matter what. You just have to do it as, as safely as possible. And again, I'm gonna uh, encourage our beauticians and things to come out and get tested at least once and maybe get tested more often than that. I mean, we need to start getting protocols depending on what you're doing for a living about where now often get tested. If you're at a maitre d' at a restaurant, you can't have a mask on. I mean, you know, you can't talk, you know, it's hard to be a maitre d' at a restaurant and can, so those people are going to be at more risk. I mean, me, I mean, I'm at more risk and I'm bringing this home to my wife. I probably need to be tested at something. And so uh, we need to get protocols that allow our city to come back in a safe fashion. And if people do get infected, that we get them identified and treated early. Um, because my, my major fear is things are going to open up and you're going to go back to your job and you're going to get COVID and you're going to have 102 temperature, but you need to go back to work. You got to pay the bills. You don't have any more sick time left. And so you're going to go to work because that's what you do. Yeah. And by the time somebody figures it out, it's going to be too late. And so we need to have protocols that say, hey, X, Y, and Z job. If this person sounds like they may have COVID, we will pay or somebody's going to pay them to have time off enough until the doctor says it's okay to come back, either because they don't have it or they get tested or whatever else. They need to have paid, I don't know what the word, sick leave mm -hmm. if there's a COVID emergency. But those are kind of things that we need to put in place to allow our, our city and our areas to come back safely, those kind of protocols and things. And that's what I'm hoping through our Cure COVID Consortium that we can source of information, help help get those things. Because if we don't if we don't do it in an organized fashion, right, it just takes just a few to get this disease back percolating and cooking. And we really don't want to see this again. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question, Dr. Gath, because we're kind of pushing on time here. It always goes by so fast. Um, there was someone that was taking an autoimmune medication, um, as a, um, as a zithropine. Azathioprine. Let me put my glasses okay. on. There I you go. You. <laughs> <laughs> Azathioprine. Yes, yes, yes. Um, see what if you have an autoimmune disease and you're taking it, um, is it okay to take a shingle shot? Uh, it is okay to take the new shingle shot. There's a new shingle shot that's out called Shingrens. There was an old shingle shot a couple of years ago that really was entirely worthless. The new shingle shot is so much better. And yes, it is okay to take the new shingle shot that's out. It's two shots and it makes much better than the old one that we've had. We had a lot of shingles questions out here, but yeah, the vaccine yeah. is absolutely fantastic. The only time I wouldn't take the vaccine is if I was sick. If I had fever, chills or flu or COVID, I tell people to wait until all that settles down. I had a patient today. He was just getting over shingles and he needs to take the vaccine. But I told him, wait, just wait three months. Let your body sort of settle down what you've gone through. And when you're feeling good, take the vaccine then. Because what you want to do when you take any vaccine, you want to be at your best. You don't want your immune system to be fighting something here and then asking mm -hmm. it to fight the shingles. You want to fight this 100%. And so any vaccine, I tell people, wait till you're well and then get the vaccine at that time. No matter hepatitis, shingles, even flu, wait till your wells, your body has the best chance of fighting off the, uh, not fighting, uh, responding to the vaccine. Got it, no, no, great, great, great question. Um, Okay, let's see here. Okay, so I'm, I've been teasing my family, Dr. Gath, because I feel like I have like the serum now, right? Like I've got the plasma. <laughs> Exactly. So, and you do, you do. I tell my family, I'm gonna save everybody because I'm just gonna, I'm a, I'm gonna just store it and save it. Is that true? Can you really do that? Can so, so the the, pla the plasma <laughs> looks, the, uh, the plasma looks like it may be a benefit to help people that have active COVID. The the problem with the plasma is that that um, treatment is not scalable. Okay. You can't take, you can't, I mean, I can take some for you and treat two or three people, but I can't take some for you and treat a thousand people. And sure. so while it's important, maybe for people that are very ill, the scalability of that okay. is not one that's practical. The good news is there's a company and I'm in contact with them called Regeneron, 
that is making artificial antibodies and they can make tons and tons of it. And the thought is that we can use that not only for treatment, but prevent for, 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 for prevention. Let's say the fall season, I'm a uh, ambulance driver. I'm in the middle of everything. I can get stored up with this for three months, have enough antibody floating around that I'm not going to get the virus while I'm working out there. And so that's one of the studies we're looking at doing. And I want to offer to the community uh, that uh, one of the things that Cure COVID Consortium UMC is doing, we're looking for treatment protocols that are better than what we have now. We have one treatment protocol for promising medicine. We're on track to perhaps have some access to some vaccine trials and some other treatment programs that will allow us to not just uh, identify people, but try to get them more state-of-the-art treatments that are out there. So stay tuned to our to you and our channel, and we're going to look forward to uh, bringing all those things to the community. We're uh, we're uh, we have a lot of work to do. We're excited about the prospects and the organizations that we have uh, that are that are going to come to to uh, to the forefront to get this pandemic and this public health emergency under control. Wow, no, this is such such great. So let's see. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Schools. What are your What are your feelings about <laughs> schools opening? <laughs> wow, I, I you know the, the fair answer is I don't know. You can't officially open up society without having schools. People can't go to work if they have no place to bring their kids. I mean, that's just in a reality. And so some kind of way we're going to, and it just can't be, you know, homeschool or would we'll have the classes at home and have the classes at school because you got to work from eight to five. I mean, right. and so, and then that's not kind of people that, you know, have nowhere else to eat or be other than at school. Mm -hmm. So we have all of that. It doesn't count that people don't have laptops. So so we're going to have to figure out some way to open up the schools. And I don't see any other way of doing that because kids aren't going to social distance and kids aren't going to wear a mask. Some kind of way we're going to have to integrate some testing program to make sure that the kids that are coming into the schools are not COVID positive. How that looks it's past my pay grade. I, I don't know how it looks. And everybody is struggling with that. But the practicality is our schools at some point in time have to open because society can't can't reopen I effectively. See. The last thing you want to do is take your kids. School's not open. I'm going to drop them off at the daycare. Or I'm going to drop them off at gra grandma's house. Yes. Uh, you yes. know, and then they have it. And then grandma, I mean, they're, it's almost worse being out here sort of running around between daycares and uh, you know people can take care of them while you're trying to go to work and and lord knows if you bring it home from work i mean all of that so some kind of way we've got to get the schools open but to tell you i know how to do that outside of some organized testing program i don't have a good answer to that right, right. how about basketball games and also you know, <laughs> football and all that since they got rid of d hop i'm not sure i want to go back to the texans anymore anyway that's that's another discussion item with my season tickets i am mad about that okay but i'm going back to my boy deshaun anyway Right. <laughs> I, I don't know how that's going to look. There's there's a, there's an interesting picture from 1917 that I have at a football game uh, during the uh, influenza epidemic in 1918, oh. and everybody in the stands were separated and had masks on. Are you serious? Absolutely. I have to show you that picture. Somebody showed oh it the other day. 1917. It actually, it's a black guy that was in the front row. I said, how did he get up there? But they all had they all they all had masks on. And so yeah. we've been here and done this in the United yeah. States before, to be quite frank. And so again, it's gonna have to open up. Uh, I think it's gonna start probably without fans in the stands because the first thing I have to do is make sure that the players are safe. I mean, right. they're the ones that, I mean, you almost have to test them semi-routinely to make sure right. that they don't have it. And then, you know, you got to figure out how to, you know, it's the, the easy part is wearing a mask. The hardest part is whether you can't effectively socially distance, mm -hmm. you know, unless somebody's mm -hmm. not sitting in the seats next to you, then who doesn't get to go to the game? We just go to the game. So again, way past my pay grade, we have to do something. Uh, and some of it, and a lot of it's going to have to be, again, testing. The more people we test to know where people are and, and get them treated mm -hmm. and not infected, the more chance we're going to have of bringing people to these areas uh, that are not mm -hmm. infected. Uh, and, and that's going to that's going to be there. So do I, you know, they keep saying the Texans are going to, you know, start their full season and starting in September. So we'll see. I just don't have a visual on that about how that's going to look. Right, right, right. Um, 
I saw a, a report yesterday. I think there was a, I think it was the Dean of Brown. I think she was at Brown and she was kind of explaining how they were going to bring their kids back in the fall. And they had a whole, you know, you know, really the housing was the big, the big question is how they going to house. So they were, they were trying to acquire more space for housing. They were going to take, you know, roommates out of the room. So now you're in a room on your own. Um, they had um, a fault, like four different cycles. And so you would go to two cycles out of the four. So you wouldn't be in school a full fall semester. You know, you have to alter and they would include two summer cycles. So um, and then they had a quarantine, a quarantine portion that Brown was going to, um, you know, acquire, I guess. So anyone positive, tested positive, they would be and basically be in quarantine with all COVID, COVID positives. It sounded it sounded resourceful in terms of how she was explaining it. Um the la we're already over our time. I just have enjoyed it so much. But just last touch on college. What do you, does that even seem realistic, Dr. Gaff? It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem realistic to me, to be quite frank. And this is back to college and, you know, being on a computer at home versus having the experience of being in college, of interacting with people. And again, you know, it's difficult to do. As I'm watching the TV, though, all of these kids are out there <laughs> at these schools and everything anyway. And so it's back to, you know, uh, you know, the kids are going to do what they're going to do anyway. And I think we're going to have to get testing programs even in the colleges to do the first keg party. The social distancing goes away, you know, right, right. but the kids are going to do what the kids are going to do. And we just have to get I can't keep emphasizing more testing has to be done to figure out who's positive to stop the process because people are going to do what they're going to do. And the more testing we have, the more people we identify, the more people we can get out of circulation, treat them and put them back in. It's going to solve a lot of these issues. And we've got to do it as quickly as possible. And it's just not an organized fashion. People are doing this here and this mm -hmm. here and these other things everywhere. It needs to be an organized response. So everybody's doing the same thing. I can't do this in Houston and Beaumont does something different because right. when people can drive from Beaumont here, you know, it 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 it, it, be it, 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 it torpedoes everything that I've done here. So it's got to be an organized effort. But testing, 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 mask as much as possible, social distance as much as possible. Those are the things going to offer because we're not going to have a vaccine anytime soon. Got we're it, just got not. It. We haven't even talked about that. We're not going to have it. And they've already said one out of five people aren't going to take it even if we have it. So I'm not counting on the vaccine. Wow. rescuing us anytime so wow well listen i am so grateful to you I mean, well thank you so thank you so much for having me and the fact yeah. you got well this was so I mean, I like you, know, you are my hero and um you. you know i didn't know if i could survive two days at home but i pushed 20 so <laughs> Anything is possible. I know you've done well. It's all good. I have. I have. I'm so grateful for you, your guidance, your care, your, your, I mean, just your, your bedside manner, Dr. Gath, um, your Zoom meetings, your texting me. I mean, just the, the, a lot, the amount of access that I had um, to my doctor um, was just priceless. So I am forever grateful to you. I promise I will stay home and I will do good and I'll see you this week. Um, but for everyone that watched today, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is another, um, another uh, day of, uh, of COVID conversations is having really genuine, um, candid conversations about COVID and how it's affected us. And my doctor, Dr. Gath, Dr. Joseph Gath, um, was, was our guest today. So um, once again, we love you all. Take care of yourself and your family. Be safe out there. Everyone knows what to do. Mask up, uh, wash your hands, and social distance as much as you can. All right. We'll see you later. Thank you, Dr. Gad. Take care. Thanks for having me. So, I'm good. So Thank good. you so much. You. And thanks for everyone right. watching today. We'll see you later. All right. Take care. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.